The sandy beaches of Brazil, 100 million years ago. While many modern coastlines are often teeming with various species of birds, this is an age where the pterosaurs dominate the skies and plunder the oceans for all they're worth. At this time of year, one stretch of coastline is host to one of the most spectacular species of all, as it is the breeding season of Elasmodromius. While in flight, they have a wingspan of 4.5 meters, and on the ground they stand nearly 2 meters tall. However, the majority of that height is due to their enormous heads. The skull alone is 1.4 meters long, as they sport an immense crest that is far larger in the males. These thin sheaths of bone are only used to their full effect during one time of the year, the mating season. Every year, thousands of Phalasmodromias fly to this long stretch of beach to mate. For females, they will only stay for a day or two. The only task they have is to choose a suitable male, mate with them, and then leave. The males will stay for two weeks, only leaving for short amounts of time to feed. Each male will pick out an area to display to the females in the air, but some areas are more sought after than others. This beach is dotted by tall pillars of rock, huge structures that have survived the constant erosion of the ocean waves. It is these areas that the males seek out above all. Competition at the top of these pillars can be fierce, but only the strongest males will be able to ward off rivals and hold their ground. A clear sign to any suitors that they are obviously the best choice. Some will land on the side of the rock pillars, if there are spaces wide enough for both themselves and any females that are interested. For the majority of the male Phalasmodromius, however, they have to either fight over the rocks on the ground, or have to try their luck on the sandy beach. Down here, it is incredibly rare that females even fly low enough to examine the hordes of displaying males. It is highly likely none of them will attract a mate. The only worst place on the beach is the shoreline, where the waves crash and flow up the sand. The ones here are essentially outcasts, and only once their drive to mate finally subsides will they give up and abandon the mating site for this year. Up on the top of the rocky outcrops where only the strongest males stand, the victors are proudly displaying themselves. This involves widening their stance, and then slowly raising their beaks up to the sky. Once they have gone as high as they can, they then slowly lower their heads, so that the back of their crests point upwards. This is meant to coerce potential mates out of the sky, as above them the females glide slowly overhead, checking each location for males with the most promising displays. When a female lands within a male's allocated space, the male in question then directs his attention solely to her. Males dwarf the females at more than twice their size, but even when they get close to their smaller counterparts, the females rarely get intimidated, as they know the choice the mate is solely up to them. Once in front of them, the males turn their heads from side to side, giving their potential mate a full, up-close and detailed look at their head crest. It is not just the size of the crest, or the patterns that cover it that the females are interested in. They are also seeing how well the male rotates his head. A smooth, well-controlled turn of the head is more appealing than a jagged turn, or if the male simply can't hold his head up long enough. All of these show how fit and healthy they are, so the longer they can keep the display clean and not show any sign of fatigue, the better chance they have of securing more mates. When they mate, it only takes a few seconds, and while most females then leave the area, some will stay and mate with other males, though they won't stay at the mating grounds for more than two days. Of course, occasionally fights will break out between the males, when it isn't clear who is larger or stronger. Usually, it is a civil affair, as those with smaller or more damaged crests get evicted. To look for a vacant spot, or contest another hopefully weaker male. When both parties don't back down, it can get violent. But all too often, it just results in mock pecks and a lot of screeching. This is because none of the males want their crests to be damaged, and so most of the time these fights just devolve into screaming matches, until one of them goes hoarse in the throat, or they just get tired and back off. 
for Velasmodromius, the risk of damaging your most valuable asset just isn't worth the physical altercation. The mating season goes on for a little over a fortnight before finally the last of the most desperate males take to the sky and resume their nomadic lifestyle. But the shores don't become silent as a different species of pterosaur return to this area not long after the large Phalasmodromius have left. Araripasaurus are about half the size of Phalasmodromius, and throughout the year they reside all across the coastline, but when the Phalasmodromius breeding season begins they have to vacate this particular area in order to make way for their larger relatives. But after the last of the bothersome Phalasmodromius have left, it isn't long before they return and the shoreline becomes just as busy and noisy as it was before. In fact, it's rare there is ever a long period of quiet in this area. Hello fellow travelers and welcome back. Today we will be breaking down a pterosaur with possibly the most extraordinary head crest of any animal. Phalasmodromius. Phalasmodromius's first remains were discovered in 1983 in northeastern Brazil in the Romaldo Formation. The holotype was a mostly complete skull that, in a rare case for pterosaur remains, was three-dimensional, so not flattened like most end up as. This fossil was split between museums in both North and South America, and wasn't brought back together until 2002. In this year was officially described and named as Phalasmodromius sethi, the genus name meaning sea runner, and the species name being after the Egyptian god Seth. This is because those who were describing the specimen thought the large crest on the animal's head looked a lot like the crown associated with Seth, that being one with two plumes. However, it was later pointed out that the Egyptian god Amon usually wears the two plume crown, so there seems to be a bit of confusion there. In another timeline, we would be calling it Thasmodromius Amoni. Some additional fragmentary remains have been attributed to Phalasmodromius, though these are also all skull material. Phalasmodromius was a pterosaur in the Phalasmodromidae family, which also includes a few other species, such as Tupaxaria. Where exactly they fit into the pterosaur family tree is contentious, however, as it flips a lot between being closely related to Tapajaridae or as Darkidae. Both of these families are closely related regardless, and therefore it's easy to see why Phalasmodromidae flips between the two. Either way, it is still a valid family. Phalasmodromius itself lived during the Albion stage of the early Cretaceous, around 110 million years ago, when South America and Africa were much closer together. Though we only have skull material, its size has been estimated from looking at closely related species, so it's estimated to have a wingspan between 4 and 5 meters from wingtip to wingtip, and stood about 2 meters tall if we're including the crest. Since the skull is all we have of this creature, let's break it down in more detail. The jaws were long, narrow, and toothless, and each ended in a curved tip. The jawbones themselves, especially the premaxilla, are noted as being very sharp. Of course, they would have been covered in some sort of keratinous sheath, but the sharpness itself is seemingly quite unique to this species. The large space in the skull, known as the nasal antorbital fenestra, is an adaptation to reduce the animal's weight, though it is quite large even for a pterosaur, being 71% of the skull's length. Behind that is the orbit, which was slender and compressed from back to front, similar to its tapijarid relatives. However, the orbit is quite low on the skull compared to them, perhaps to accommodate its large crest. At the back of the skull, called the supraoptical bone, there are preserved muscle scars showing that strong muscles were attached here, no doubt needed to hold up a skull that was longer than its entire body. The crest itself ran from the tip of the upper jaw to far beyond the back of the skull itself. The entirety of the crest is double both the length and the height of the skull. The majority of the crest is just made up of the premaxillae bone, which runs along the entire top length of the crest, joining with the frontal bones, parietal bones, and part of the supraoptical bone, connected by sutures. 
Despite its size, it's still quite light, being between 1 and 10 millimeters thick and almost hollow on the inside. The top of the crest ends in a signature V shape, which before you ask, is not due to any breakage, as the fossil of the bone is still encased in a matrix. Velasmodromius had possibly the largest crest of any vertebrate, with it making up 75% of the skull's side surface. Tupendactylus may be larger, but most of its crest isn't pure bone, but consists mostly of softer tissue and keratin. So perhaps saying Phalasmodromius had the largest bone crest of any vertebrate would be a better way of putting it. The fossil also preserves traces of blood vessels all along it, showing that it had some form of keratinous covering. It was proposed that Phalasmodromius would use its crest for thermal regulation, facing the side of it towards the sun to heat up, and facing the narrow edge towards the sun in order to cool down. While it is possible that it did use it in this way, it likely didn't evolve for this purpose and was a secondary adaptation. For one, pterosaurs would have been very well adapted for keeping insulated, as they were more likely warm-blooded than cold-blooded, had a covering of pygnofibers, a system of internal air sacs, and a respiratory system similar to modern birds. The most accepted theory about the crest is that it was a display structure, used to signal the animal's age, health, intimidate, and most importantly, as a way to attract mates. It could be that the males had these large display crests, and the females either had none or much reduced ones. Of course, we only have one decent fossil, so many more would we need to be found to confirm this. However, there is a precedence for this in well-sampled species, such as Pteranodon. It is important to note that the growth of the crest on Phalasmodromius seems to have happened later in life, only reaching full size once it was fully mature. Moving on to diet, it was proposed that Phalasmodromius was a skim feeder, which was a common idea applied to many pterosaurs. To address this quickly, the only modern family of birds that skim feed are the Rhychops genus, which have very specialized beaks and muscles in order to perform this type of hunting. As we can see, Phalasmodromius does not have any skull features that would allow it to skim feed, and it was just too large to do so. In fact, no pterosaurs so far found have these adaptations. So what was Phalasmodromius feeding on? To answer that, we do have to look at some anatomical features of its closest relatives, since as said earlier, we only have skull material for Phalasmodromius itself. Phalasmodromids have short necks, strong shoulders, and longer hind legs. These adaptations are more comparable to Asdarkids, which are famous for being terrestrial predators, acting akin to giant ground stalks. If Phalasmodromius was similar to its relatives, then it likely spent a significant amount of time on the ground, and likely even ran prey down using its sharp beak to stab into and cut open small prey. Based on the muscle attachment points found on the skull, it had a robust jaw and a strong bite for a pterosaur so it may have been able to hold its own against prey similar in size to itself. It is noted by the researchers that a lot more work needs to be done on this group, however. For now, it's not clear what they were feeding on, or what niche they may have occupied. They may have even been omnivores, for all we know. Velasmodromia sports some of the most over-the-top headwear I've ever seen, and if the theory of its crest being sexually dimorphic are true, it's another example of how sexual selection can move a species down a path of incredible adaptations, to the point where it may become a hindrance to the species in general. But what do you think of Phalasmodromius? And for my question of the week, when it comes to display structures like Phalasmodromius's crest, do you think the animals were smart enough to know their value, and therefore know to protect them? Or do you think when push came to shove, they simply tried to survive regardless? What lesser known pterosaur would you like me to do a breakdown on next? And until then, please like, share, subscribe, and thank you for watching.